The following program is sponsored by the Canadian Battle of Normandy Foundation. The foundation, comprised of veterans of the Battle of Normandy, of veterans of other theatres in the three services, and of scholars, students, and ordinary Canadian citizens, was created to commemorate the military deeds of Canadian servicemen in the Battle of Normandy and in World War II in general. This program is dedicated to all Canadian veterans that played a role in D-Day and the Normandy Campaign of 1944. Some made it home, some will forever remain in the fields of France. They were all willing to sacrifice whatever it took for our continued freedom. That should forever be remembered. Welcome to France. This is the coast of Normandy and this is Juno Beach. It is beautiful here this morning. The uh, seagulls are in the air, the water is fairly calm, the church bells from Cresul are in the air. Simply a beautiful morning. But 50 years ago, things were very, very different. 50 years ago, this beach was covered by thousands of soldiers hitting the beaches, storming the, the beach areas and the German defenses. The battle to liberate Europe was underway. Hello, I'm Archie Miller. I'd like you to imagine with me hundreds of landing craft unloading thousands of young Canadians onto a mined beach. Bullets flying, bombs overhead from ships at sea, tanks and materiel moving away from the water, planes back and forth, young friends being injured or killed all along this beach. This was a very important date in this century and Canadians played a major role. World War II had been underway for almost five years. Plans to invade Europe, to take back the countries occupied by the German army, had been discussed for some time. The successes in North Africa, Sicily, and on the Italian mainland had shown that the tide of war could be turned, but what remained was the need for a landing in force on the European mainland. The coast of Normandy was chosen as the site. Without a strong Allied contingent with a firm foothold in Europe to confront the German army, the war could have gone on for many more years with dire consequences for the entire world. What took place will remain forever in the minds of many. Normandy was a place of pride for Canadians. The Canadian paratroopers were the first to hit French soil on June the 6th, 1944. First night ashore, I was on patrol with a friend of mine and a shell landed in the hedgerow and didn't explode. Well, we knew it landed. If it had exploded, we, didn't know it. we wouldn't have known it landed. And he said to me, uh, it takes guts to be here. And I said, now you tell me. As I say, once I, once I got in and that I turned pretty patriotic, I would have done anything for my country. And that's the way it was. The emotional memories of what war meant to those who were there never die. The reality of the death and destruction of the invasion of Normandy was a shock for many of the Canadian troops. Nothing could fully prepare a young man for this experience. At the beginning of the war, only those who had been through it before knew what to expect and they feared its arrival. I had fought in 1918 at the Somme and at Verdun as a sergeant serving in a rifle corps. So I knew that it was over, that the battle had been won. And I wished they wouldn't talk about a war. The war drum sound was distant with ultimatums traded, but we wished we couldn't hear the drum at all. Then a cruise ship got torpedoed and 
Poland got invaded. And the news got worse as summer turned to fall. I saw my wife steal glances at our son, just turned 18. Each time she heard the whistle of a train. And I knew that she recalled the day I'd left for overseas. I wished to never taste that cup again. Then, one September afternoon, our worst nightmare came true when King George's solemn voice confirmed our fear. The headlines stating, War Declared, were packed with deja vu. The war we couldn't wish away was here. After the First World War, called the War to End All Wars, the world watched as a combination of events, especially a depression, led to the rise of Nazi power and their aggressive approach to other countries and peoples who did not fall under their philosophy. Talking, appeasement failed, and war was declared in September of 1939. The German army moved quickly, a lightning war of blitzkrieg, and soon Poland, Denmark, Norway, Holland, Luxembourg, and Belgium were overrun. Resistance to the German advance failed, and led to the evacuation of the British Expeditionary Force with its back to the sea at Dunkirk. It would not be long before France would also surrender. This at a time when Canada was just coming out of a depression. It was such a depression that the country had never experienced anything like it before. Uh, there was tremendous unemployment. Uh, we were just beginning to dig ourselves out of this long depression uh, when the war broke out. So life was pretty darn grim. If you got a salary of uh, $800,000 a year, you were considered to be fairly fortunate. At the beginning of the war, jobs were scarce and there were few opportunities. The war in its own way offered employment, a job, motivation, and three square meals. Many young Canadians were quick to join up and their action prompted others to follow. Many of the veterans we talked to were affected by the depression and it may have served as a motivation to join up, but it wasn't the only one. For the most part, they all had their own reasons. Well, there was a depression on and uh, there was no jobs. Really nothing to do in a small town, so when the boys were coming home on leave that had joined up and had money in their pocket and they looked healthy and well, I thought, well, that's the thing for me to do. So I went to Winnipeg and I joined up. I'm standing on the street one day pondering what I should do when somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, you're just the person we're looking for. And I looked around, here was a great big sergeant major in uniform. So I said, well, why, what do you want me for? And he said, well, to go over and fight the enemy, he said, in Europe. And I knew what he was talking about, so I said, well, why not? So 15 minutes later, I was in the tent and divert, or not divert, but uh, work point barracks, mm -hmm. getting my uniform on and meeting some of the other young lads that were there as well. Why did you decide to go in the military? Well, I guess it was the same as a lot of us farm boys. We decided it was a good chance to get out and see the world. Of the Canadians who joined up, many felt an excitement at the thought of going overseas and of fighting the enemy. But apart from hearing stories of the previous war, few really knew what to expect. At the beginning, for most, the act of joining up was simply personal. But as they began to really understand the evil that was Nazi Germany, Hitler's Germany, they perceived that theirs was a just cause. It was something that they had to get involved in. I heard a lot about the war, the First Great War, from my dad and others. And uh, I'd never forgot the stories that I'd heard at that time. And, and I thought, well, you know, I should do my bit too. I wouldn't say there was any great rush to the colors with people saying, you know, hurrah for the king and, and, uh, and the prime minister, especially the prime minister. But there was nevertheless uh, quite a surge. There, there was a feeling that somehow or other Hitler had to be stopped. I signed up because the bloody Germans killed my best friend Jack. He was my hero, pal, and older brother. We hunted, fished, and swam together up near Chilliwack. 
when she got the news that nearly killed my mother. Driven by my memories and pain and hate and rage, I vowed to take no prisoners overseas. In the end, I couldn't do it. Most were scared and just my age. And may have had a brother, just like me. You ask me why I joined up? <laughs> Let me tell you, mate. I was pumping gas at Hope and hanging bout, and room and board and pocket change just wasn't all that great when you could earn more shooting that kraut. Screw the king and country bit and duty and devotion. Just give me dames and red wine in the sun. Put me on a transport ship and get me across the ocean, just like my Uncle Bill in World War I. I enlisted because at high school grad in 1943, some words they spoke in speeches packed a sting. I was sure the girls in principal were looking right at me when he spoke of courage, valor, guts, and king. The day I left, the gang was down at Roxy sipping cokes. I didn't want to leave New West to fight. When the taxi came to pick me up, I looked back at my folks until they blurred and disappeared from sight. I joined up in a Highland regiment, and in September 1939, when I went down to barracks, I was issued with a kilt, a sporin, white spats, red socks, First World War tunic, First World War webbing, First World War rifle and bayonet, and that was it. We had uh, our signals equipment, for example, was all World War I. We had no wireless. We didn't have a vehicle in the unit. We didn't even have a pair of roller skates. We had no two-inch mortars, no three-inch mortars, no anti-tank guns. Uh, we had, in a word, very, very little, extremely little. Uh, we had enough ammunition so that if, you know, if a German force did land on the shores of Nova Scotia, we could fire at them for about half hour, then we'd have to retreat. Uh, it was like that. And the same thing held not only with my regiment, that was typical of all the regiments in Canada. Most of these Canadian regiments simply weren't equipped for the modern warfare of 1940 standards. Priorities in Canada's pre-war economy were jobs and taking care of the homeless, not tanks and airplanes. But by the time France was under German control and Britain was being blasted with bombs, the threat to our freedom became a reality. It took few words to describe the state of our military in 1939. In a word, I suppose you could call it gruesome. We were terribly unprepared. We had a permanent force, in other words, regular force, I'm talking about the army now, of about uh, 3,500. In other words, we had enough soldiers, so you would have one soldier per mile of border between here and the United States, if you want to look at it that way. At their military bases, the Canadian soldiers received extensive training, with particular concentration on physical fitness and the specific skills needed to get the job done and to stay alive. Of the two groups of soldiers we have featured in this program, the Canadian Scottish, after training in Canada and England, became part of the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division, 7th Infantry Brigade, who would land on the Mike section of Juneau Beach on June 6, 1944. Training began almost immediately after joining up. Almost at once, yes. And what kind of things did they train you for? Oh, PT mostly to start with, and then marches, and uh, training with the different weapons like the rifle and so on and so forth, you know. And of course at that time Canada was very short on arms of any kind. And uh, once we left Victoria and went to Debert, Nova Scotia, uh, we were training with uh, broom handles and everything else. The other group we've focused on, the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion, received training in Canada before going for specific parachute skills and close quarter fighting exercises in the U.S., then on to England. They went into Normandy with the 6th British Airborne Division just after midnight on the 6th, with crucial objectives inland from Sword Beach. During basic training, we had one of these nice snappy paratroopers come out to camp and ask for volunteers to go into the paratroops. I was the first one up. <laughs> Is that right? I was the first one who walked up there. That just right away, as soon as he mentioned it, it just struck me as something very exciting. This is what I wanted to do, so. The training in the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion, uh, right from the beginning, 
It's a 10 mile run every morning before breakfast. And then back, quick shower, shave, breakfast. Very quickly, and then on parade. Now the training, you had a training syllabus that worked out on a 90 day training syllabus, seven days a week. In that training syllabus, you had to do one 50 mile forced march a month and three 25 mile forced marches a month. Plus all your other training, such as mortars and uh, thicker guns and whatever else that had to come up. So you were training from pre-daylight till after daylight every day of the week. The Canadian forces received their basic training in Canada before being sent here to England to such bases as Portsmouth, Southampton and Plymouth where they received further training and acted as a defensive force in case of attack. With most of the European mainland under German control, these young Canadian troops were fully aware that its invasion was inevitable and so they waited. Some waited for years before receiving their call to battle. The long wait to be called up to fight was somewhat demoralizing. The troops practiced war and waited. They practiced landings and waited. They fought imaginary enemies and waited. England became their home. They had love and made friends. They played games and sports and even at times got to play tourist. They did everything but go to war. Overall, I would say that the Canadian soldiers integrated with the British population very, very well. Um, some of the English people seem to like them. I think we got about, what, 50 or 60,000 married English women over there. Um, no, I think, uh, I think we integrated very, very well. It's so much so that for those in the, you know, who went over in 1939, 14, 41, by 1945, we considered England uh, almost as home. In other words, if I was in Italy, as I was, you would say, I'm going home to England rather than home to Canada. It was an odd thing. The idea of becoming close friends with someone who might die beside you in battle was frowned upon by some. But all in all, the Canadians always stuck together. Life, for our young soldiers, would have been an experience. It was exciting. Um, there was a blackout on. Uh, we, got, uh, we were in the south of England. We usually got a, a Saturday pass, Saturday afternoon. It was uh, not only a half hour's train ride into the downtown London, and it was fairly reasonable. We had a few shillings, we could go to a show, and uh, the Beaver Club in London, which was run by volunteers, uh, would give us uh, tickets to various shows and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so you did keep pretty busy? Oh, sure. In the spring of 1942, the Allied position was very poor. They had hoped to gain some superiority in the air and on the sea, but this had not happened. The Germans were pushing into Russia, North Africa was still held by the German army, and Hitler was looking across the English Channel to Great Britain. The Canadians in England were ready and eager to fight, eager to make their mark by stopping Hitler. most anxious to get into battle, you know. But of course, like everything else, uh, you had to wait. Well, we were sort of getting uh, a little tired of this repetitious training, and we all wanted to get into action. Everybody I met, there was a little story by the Germans uh, who said they had a chap by they called Lord, Lord Haha. I don't know if you ever heard this story or not. And he would come on periodically and broadcast. We didn't know how he did it, but he did. And he would say that Canadians have two armies, one fighting to get home and one fighting at home trying to get over here. Well, it's not quite true. Most of the chaps were very anxious to get with a regiment that was definitely going to go into action. 
In the summer of 1942, it was decided to mount a major raid on German-held territory on the French coast. The plan held that this raid would instill some fear in the German high command and would afford an opportunity to test equipment and techniques as well as gain some experience. This became the controversial and still much debated Dieppe raid, which cost so much in Canadian lives. I don't think uh, Dieppe had much impact um, on the resolve of Canadians. You know, they, they would probably think, well, you know, tough luck, as indeed it was. But uh, by God, when we hit them again, we'll know a lot better on, on how to do it. And there, there is no doubt either that we learned lessons from Dieppe, uh, a great many. And some we learned we, we shouldn't have needed to learn. But um, Dieppe was beneficial to that extent, that we did uh, take into consideration many things that we might not have when we planned for Normandy. of the losses at Dieppe were well known, but not a particular worry as most felt that something had been learned by that disastrous exercise and that all would work out next time. It was just another commando raid, as far as we were concerned, bigger than the previous ones. Dieppe was a disaster, a political disaster, and uh, we figured that uh, the Airborne, anyway, the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion, we figured, well, if if we do our job, and the ground troops do their job, this should be, the invasion should be okay. But if, the, if we do our job, and the invasion on the beach don't, we're, we're history. We knew that. They told us that, that, that if it doesn't succeed, we'll never come back. Once that Dieppe affair was over, we, we uh, had it in our mind then that we was not going to fail. In basic terms, the conflict which had engulfed the world was being fought in two separate theaters of war, one in Europe and one in Southeast Asia and the South Pacific. It had been realized, however, that the key to ending the world war lay in winning the battle in Europe and the rest would follow. The plans to do just this had been discussed for some time. And this is where those plans were debated, formulated and approved. This is Southwick, or Southwick House, near Portsmouth, England. And this is where all that planning went together. The plans called for a full-scale invasion of the European mainland. The plans were of enormous complexity. Everybody knew that there was a great deal at stake. The time has come to give the enemy a terrific blow in Western Europe. The plan for the D-Day landing, the beginning of the Normandy invasion, Operation Overlord called for a number of things to be accomplished in order to ensure that there would be a good chance for success and ultimately victory and an end to the war. Now there are several things that, that they had to take into consideration. They had to have command of the sea. They had to have command of the air. And they had to have uh, hard-hitting, well-trained, well-supplied uh, army formations to hit the beach with such a wallop that they'd be able to make the initial bridgehead. Um, that was one thing. Another thing, of course, was to keep the Germans from knowing where and when we were going to invade. Key to the entire action was surprise, complete surprise. And a great deal of effort went into convincing the Germans that the inevitable attack would come elsewhere on the coast. This surprise was achieved in no small way by the virtual air superiority held over the Channel and the English coast. 
This allowed for a massive concentration of men, materiel, and ships to assemble in preparation for the attack. All of this effort would have gone for naught if it hadn't been for the success of another one of Operation Overlord's priorities, the establishment of a harbor at which to land the crucial supplies. Recognizing that it might take time to take one of the French ports, the Allies did what was needed and brought their own, artificial ports or mulberries. While the troops trained endlessly and rehearsed beach invasions and sensed the day was quickly approaching, they knew very little about where or when. Hitler knew as well as anyone that an invasion of Western Europe was inevitable. He began to increase the defenses of his so-called Fortress Europe. Endless bunkers, mines and tank traps all pointed to the fact that a successful Allied invasion would have to be well planned or risk being thrown back into the sea. An account of the German army in the summer of 1944 outlined that it was not as efficient or effective as it had been. The war in the east on the Russian front and losses in North Africa and Sicily had depleted both morale and battle strength. But there was no doubt that they were still arguably the best fighting force anywhere. An historian had noted that they were raised and trained to fight. The beaches, the lands were mined, the bunkers, the gun emplacements were prepared, the tanks and manpower were in reserve. Our Canadian troops knew what to expect. This would be a fight to the death, with no surrender this time. They could not think of anything but victory. It's with me yet. I can't forget that D-Day in the dawn. Seasick, lashed with spray and numb with fear. And the rosaries and praying on the barge that I was on as we neared the beach and touchdown time came near. There was sea spray, urine, vomit, sloshing all about, and sweat on every brow. Though it was cold, then we knew that we were landing when we heard the sergeant shout, I'll shoot any man who won't jump when he's told. My only thought was, stay alive. We moved as in a spell. I don't recall the landing ramp being dropped. Then I was waiting in the sea through a concentrated hell where men before me crumpled, spun, or flopped. We were caught in a crisscross fire with shrapnel all around. We tried to float the wounded men ahead, but they became like shields, so that when we crawled aground, the very men we tried to help were dead. Those of us still able tried to make it to the wall, the only place in sight to make a stand. Bagpipes and my pounding heart of sounds that I recall as I did that deadly dash across the sand. Later on, I came to learn some ironies of war. Things that happen, out of place, against design. Like when we started inland. Just a hundred yards from shore, a small cafe was open, selling wine. The 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion was the first to go in after 1 a.m. They led the way for one of the most historically important days of the century. day landing was a success. There were some problems along the various beaches. The Allies were not as far inland as planned, and the city of Caen had not been taken. But the sea and air bombardment had done its job fairly well in softening up the German defenses. Both Victoria's Canadian Scottish Regiment 
and the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion played a major role in this success. For those who were there, it was a day they will never forget. We were told before we started, of course, that we had to have an early breakfast on the ships and um, before we landed, you see. <clears throat> and everybody was so seasick that uh, I think most of them decided they'd like, wish they could have died on the boat rather than on shore. I'm telling you, everybody was sick, including the sailors. It was rough going across, very rough. But then when daylight came and we looked and saw those thousands of ships and airplanes and whatnot, this was the greatest sight I've ever seen in my life. That's what struck me the most on the early morning of D-Day. Well, when we were flying over the English Channel going towards France, there was really no fear. It was excitement. And then once the, the ak ak started going off and the plane started to rock and shake, then all we could think of, at least myself, was put that green light out and let's get the hell out of this plane. Because I'd rather be on the ground fighting than be shot down in the, or the plane blown up. So then out we went and going down wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't too bad. We jumped at 700 feet. So we hit the ground pretty fast. And then once we hit the ground, then all hell broke loose. So I remember getting on the back of this one tank and looking up over the top. And of course, uh, the enemy, they were looking too, and they were firing <laughs> several of these anti-tank shells and whatnot at us. And I remember they were bouncing on the ground. They were red hot. And that's one thing I remember distinctly was these shells bouncing on the ground just like a ball. And I thought, and this old tank was going back and forth, and I thought, I better get the heck off of here. I'm going to be blowing up. By the end of D-Day, the Canadian troops were safely ashore and advancing inland, although only one Canadian unit had reached its assigned objective. The German defenders all along this stretch of Normandy coast had been destroyed, and within a couple of days, all the beaches of the invasion, Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno and Sword would be linked. Further inland, the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion fought fearlessly to reach its objectives of securing bridges and roads in efforts to slow a German counterattack. You have a job to do and you know what your job is. And you, you go do that job to the best of your ability. And we all had jobs to do and I think we all tried to do them correctly. And uh, if interruptions came in that we had to change, well, we changed. And uh, if we were successful, that meant we didn't get hurt too bad. Sometimes we didn't do it correctly, and we lost some people because of it. An account of the day summarizes that the landing had totaled over 132,000 troops from the sea, over 23,000 paratroopers, almost 6,000 vehicles, including 900 tanks and armored vehicles, 600 guns, and over 4,000 tons of supplies. As one historian has noted, the Allies were in Normandy to stay. We had been waiting for that day for years. You know, it was now June the 6th, 1944. War had started September 1939. Uh, and it, it was met in Canada, I think, with a great deal of delight and joy. And of course, a considerable amount of apprehension by parents who had uh, sons overseas in the division. Um, so there would be apprehension there without a doubt. But it was a relief, my word, it was a relief to at last get on the soil of Europe and start getting uh, uh, good punches in at Hitler. The feelings of patriotism and of just cause were clearly evident early in the war. But for the D-Day troops, these feelings strongly compounded as they met the citizens that they were liberating. The Canadians realized that all freedom was at stake, including that of their loved ones at home in Canada. At this point in the war, life in Canada was much different. According to the news from home, females were recruited, and other things that sounded just as strange, like women wearing coveralls, and punks who were zoot suited? Most things back home were in a state of change. Some foods were on a ration list, like sugar and butter and meat. Even tires and tea were classed as frills. 
Any kind of chocolate bar became a special treat. To save gas, drivers coasted down the hills. They had canteens for servicemen where mothers watched their daughters and blackout rules with curtains pulled at night and air raid drills with sirens and anti-aircraft spotters and air raid wardens shouting, douse that light. And how was Uncle Billy getting by on liquor rations? <laughs> Most likely back to brewing bathtub booze. Were they selling paint on stockings down at Barrel's Fashions? along with bobby socks and saddle shoes? Was our steward at the Legion, Harry Peachy, keeping well? And how were things at all my other haunts? Did the gang still hang around at the Adams Guard Hotel and at Henry's and the Red Spot Restaurant? There soon would be but little left of the things I used to cherish as we poised to launch the Normandy campaign. With the changes back at home, and the hometown boys to perish, Abbotsford could never be the same. Flash, an old French chapel selected as headquarters for the public relations services, comes under enemy fire. The war correspondents thought they had a nice comfortable billet, but Jerry had the range taken. He soon Accounts of Operation Overlord were prominent in the news in Canada. The papers carried a running account of the actions in progress, as well as references to those who were wounded or killed. The Canadian economy was sound and improving, with the war effort fueling an upsurge in work and productivity, and with women taking an active role in all aspects of industry. There was rationing of such things as fuel and certain foodstuffs, but for the most part, life in Canada during this time was quite good, and a far cry from just a decade before. The Canadian war economy, contributing weapons, food and clothing, played a major role in the Allies' success. By the end of 1943, our war economy was such that we could equip an entire division with everything they needed, artillery, tanks, trucks, uh, mortars, everything, every six weeks, which was a, uh, you know, we became one of the major suppliers uh, for the entire uh, Allied force. There was the United States, uh, Great Britain, then Canada, Russia would come next. The landing of the Canadians in D-Day, June 6, 1944, would see them hit Juneau Beach. Their objective was to secure their coastal section, to move inland on various fronts, and to take and hold the city of Caen. Those veterans that we've interviewed for this program, those of Canadian Scottish, came in on Juneau Beach with the 7th Infantry Brigade. Those that we've interviewed who were part of the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion came in with a 6th British Airborne. Shortly after midnight on June the 6th, some six hours before the full invasion would take place, and they were to secure a variety of positions inland from and to the east of Sword Beach. All acquitted themselves very well in the Battle of Normandy, which would go on until the late part of August of 1944. That summer in Normandy saw our young Canadian soldiers face incredible situations. The Germans were not going to give up France without a fight to the death. The Canadians had to have the same resolve. It would be a bloody victory. The Canadian soldiers met every conceivable situation during Operation Overlord. Some died in the first few seconds of battle, while others fought for days and weeks before meeting an end. Some were wounded and returned to the line, while others had to sit out while their friends went on without them. Some fought the entire war with a little bit of scratch, and still others, such as Slim Skalicki of the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion, were captured and spent most of their time as prisoners of war. Well, I went in with the intentions of getting killed or getting wounded. I never once thought of being a prisoner of war. It never ever entered my mind, but I did think about getting killed or wounded. Mm -hmm. But uh, I ended up being a prisoner of war. I guess maybe I was one of the lucky ones because there was a lot of them that didn't. We didn't have time to read anything at that time. We were in the thick of it, and it was, as I said, it was a bad show. Because we ended up there uh, holding this bridge, and there's quite a, a number of the people getting wounded and whatnot. 
And I think I was the only senior NCO left. There was about 21 men to hold that bridge, and we didn't sleep a wink, I can tell you that. And there was a counterattack took place at the time, uh, the next morning, like, <coughs> with tanks and infantry. And uh, the, um, we had been loaned a British officer, and he got the map coordinates and brought down artillery on this uh, bunch coming in at us. And if he hadn't stopped them, or if the artillery hadn't stopped them at that time, we wouldn't be here today. They'd have gone right to the beach because there was nothing between us and the beach. You live with these fellas 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's, it's more than family because you're so close. And now after you've been in action, you know what each one of those people have done. There's the other thing. Once they have been in battle, they're battle trained, and they're going to be a better soldier for you on the first few four or five days of the next action. They know what to do, have a better idea. They know they can get hurt. And that's very important because until someone does get hurt, you don't realize that people can get hurt, that those things they're firing at you hurt. And we had a chap by name who was our company sergeant major, Glenn Emery, who was a fabulous soldier. A real go-hung guy and a real top-notch man, young man. Ran across an open field in a frontal attack in daylight. And of course, he was mowed down. We had another one, Sergeant LaCasse, did identically the same thing. But after you've been around for a while, you don't do those kind of things anymore. You sort of wait till them come to you. And if you do have to attack, you know how you're going to attack and what you're attacking. And that you learn only from being in it. All at once, as we moved inland, there were hornets all around. Oh, bullets cutting down the waist-high wheat. Of all the German shock troops we'd met the most renowned, we were up against the 12th SS idiot. We were halfway through the wheat field, and the SS had our range. The guys on either side of me were shot. It was living in a nightmare, horror-filled and strange. And though you longed to wake up, you could not. They had better tanks and rifles and were battle-tested troops. We were green, so every battle was a rout. When our proud Black Watch was slaughtered, we dug in to regroup for the real war that you'll never read about. We were ordered to advance while they pulverized one town. We all thought we'd be blown apart or hit. One lieutenant ran around when the shells were pounding down, then found a hole in a whimper in the equipment. At first, the battle-hardened Germans had the upper hand, and to better them became our costly quest. But the tide of battle turned when we came to understand if we broke their ranks, then we would be the best. So that land of hedgerow havoc became a prideful place in July when we broke through the SS line. For the first time since Dieppe, there was pride on every face as we started down that rough road to the Rhine. As you move through Normandy, you are reminded at virtually every turn in the narrow roads that what went on here 50 years ago was truly a life and death kill or be killed situation. At such locations as in Guernsey, Baisley, and Corsul, you are reminded of Canadian sacrifice. And at cemeteries in Ranville and Beni Sumer, the myriad of maple leaves on the stones attest to fierce battles and much hardship. Canadians gave a great deal in blood in the Normandy campaign, and there are literally hundreds of places all over Normandy where you will find the maple leaf and the Canadian flag. With the battle going well, the liberation of France and later other portions of Europe provided a mixture of emotions, a powerful roller coaster ride for the troops. Many Canadians, as the people of France cheered these same forces as they moved victoriously through their, their cities, their villages, and their countryside, the efforts of the Canadian force was well respected by the French people and is strongly remembered today. Commemoration of Canada's contribution can be found throughout Normandy, particularly in the city of Caen. Liberated by Canadian forces,
Caen was devastated by some of the fiercest fighting in Normandy. Today, Caen, reborn and reconstructed, stands as a strong symbol of the human spirit. From nothing more than a pile of rubble to a once more prosperous city. By the time Caen was liberated, the tide had swung. The Germans were on the run as the Allied forces chased them back through the Rhineland, liberating Europe as they went. As this drive towards and after the heart of the German force, they crossed the Orne River, engaged in a fierce fight with some of Germany's best common divisions, and then moved on to attack both sides of the Khan Falaise Road. These actions allowed the American forces to break out and head towards an encircling of the German troops at a huge pocket at Falaise. After much concentrated and fierce fighting, the German troops were encircled, and while some did escape, the Falaise Gap was closed about the 19th of August. The German army retreated back to their own frontiers, and on August 25th, Paris was liberated. The war would still go on, but the Normandy campaign was at an end. This is truly an emotional, incredible place. This is the Canadian War Cemetery at Benny sur mer The beaches of Normandy are behind me. Most of us, especially those of us who have never had to go to war, have images of war based on movies and newsreels and books. Bombs explode, the machines of battle race to and fro, soldiers charge about shooting rifles and machine guns, and then there's that great riotous celebration of victory. Well, the reality is very different, and it's almost impossible to convey through mere words and pictures. Only those who were actually there, at war, in battle, will ever know what it was really like. There are no words that can describe a battle's gagging stench, or recreate a horror half as stark as finding in the gray dawn when you wake up in a trench that you've dug through buried corpses in the dark. And who'd believe that injuries when landmines detonate are often from some unimagined thing, like a flying hand or helmet or a boot or partial plate or a buddy's silver graduation ring. You're afraid of going forward, but too proud to go back. A hole becomes a pretty welcome place. You're sure you're going to crack with the very next attack. You're afraid of death and afraid of losing face. That's cause war's a learning process. Not just guns and gear and cordite, corpses, tanks, and tangled wire. And the key thing to be learned is how to master fear. And you can only learn that under fire. The price of victory was very high. Many young men died or were seriously wounded. Some bear scars visible for all to see. Other scars lie deeply hidden in the soul. A generation of young men were permanently altered. But throughout it all, and in the years since, they knew that what they did was needed. Someone had to stand up to the tyranny that was holding Europe, and for that matter the world, in a tight grip. There is no doubt that the price paid for our freedom was worth it. I fought right from D-Day on, and uh, was severely wounded just ten days before the war ended. Uh, I've seen a lot of my buddies go, a lot of my friends uh, went by the wayside. I lost my driver that had gone in with me on D-Day. Uh, when I was wounded, he was blown up and killed. Uh, my signaler was wounded with me. So, and, and I'm still paying the price uh, through the wartime injuries. And uh, I'd do it again if I had to. I wouldn't want to, but I would do it again. The price of war is very high. From your opinion, you're a historian, but also you were involved. Is the price worth it? Absolutely, when you think of the alternative. And that's what you have to think of. Because, speaking personally, I had no desire whatsoever to live in a country or in a world that would be dominated by, shall we say, the Nazis. So it was worth it. Some question the price that was paid for this victory, but few question its overall importance. 
the liberation of France and later all Europe held great relevance for the world, life and freedom, and brought about great pride in being a Canadian. Here at this D-Day Museum in Aramash, the, the Normandy campaign and the D-Day landings are thoroughly and effectively displayed, and Canada's involvement is well documented. Most historians note that Canada became a country independent and strong at the top of Vimy Ridge in World War I. Normandy only served to strengthen that favorable world opinion. Our strength and efforts proved that our way of life was second to none. Canadians at home and abroad made a difference. Whether they saved a life or saved a tin can for the factory that made the weaponry, it was Canada's victory as well as Europe's. Every one of our young soldiers that went through Normandy took great pride in being Canadian. Your patriotism and your pride. And we were proud of the fact that we were Canadians. And we carried ourselves that way. And we took a back seat to nobody. When victory in Europe finally arrived on May 8, 1945, Canada stood proud as a victorious sovereign nation. Celebrations and victory parades were staged across the country. The museums which chronicle D-Day and the Normandy campaign are great in number and sincere in their portrayal. They each want to tell an important story. The story of a fight for freedom and how that fight affects their lives even today. At museums all across southern England and the northwestern coast of France, you are reminded that an incredible event in world history took place there. You are further prompted to remember not only the event, but the people involved. It was a human event of great sacrifice, and from a Canadian point of view, it is with great emotion that we remember that Canada was proudly front and center much of the time. Our Canadian involvement in the Normandy campaign is well documented in these museums, and even more so in those across Canada. From the National War Museum in Ottawa to the Museum of the Canadian Scottish Regiment in Victoria, the story is presented in words, pictures, and artifacts all reminders of the monumental importance of a few days in history 50 years ago. There were also many fine books available to add background and personality to this historical event. A 50th anniversary commemorative edition entitled Bloody Victory by Granite Stein and Morton and 1944 The Canadians in Normandy by Reginald Roy are excellent accounts of what went on. There are hundreds of others to choose from including many regimental histories such as for the Canadian Scottish Regiment and for 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion. There is much to learn from this part of our past and no shortage of material to learn from. It's our responsibility to actively remember what happened. Just ask one of our veterans. I would like them to remember with the hopes that it would prevent it from happening again really and I think Everyone you talk to will feel the same as I do. I, I don't think that any Canadian should ever forget what these guys went through and what they gave their lives for so that we could have the peace, security that we've got today. And I think that they made a great contribution towards this. For those who were in Normandy, there is much to remember. But as this was a human event, it is their friends who lie in the fields of France who are the reason our veterans will never forget. It was a young men's war. Uh, we're talking now about people in their late teens and early 20s. People that you lived with for years. Friends, chums, buddies, all the rest of it. And you remember them uh, back in the 40s, shall we say, uh, before they were killed. And come Remembrance Day or on an occasion like this, the 50th anniversary, you think of those young pals and wish that they were here.
it's so peaceful. It's hard to imagine what went on here 50 years ago. But this is where so many young Canadians came of age. Some got to go home, some will remain forever here in France. They were willing to sacrifice whatever was needed for victory, and that should be remembered. The Normandy campaign is a major part of world history. It's a very important part of Canadian history. And we encourage you to find out more about Canada's integral involvement in the Normandy campaign. Visit a museum, read a book, come over here for a visit and see how these people revere our Canadian troops. Talk to a veteran. Most important, remember, remember the veterans, our Canadian veterans, and the sacrifices that they made for us. I'm Archie Miller. Thank you very much for watching. The preceding program was a presentation of Rogers Community Forum, Surrey. The Canadian Battle of Normandy Foundation was pleased to sponsor the preceding program. For more information or to contribute to the Foundation, please contact the office in your area.